All right, shall I get started? Let's get started. So today we'll talk about position-based dynamics, and I think you're going to love it. <laughs> and I will tell you why in a, in a moment. <coughs> so I hope you all got your rigid bodies figured out. I, I noticed a bunch of questions on canvas, which is good. <laughs> that they were that it challenged you a little bit, which is good. <laughs> So the homework number two is released as of now. And the last thing we need to d discuss with you, the last thing we need to go through so you can do your homework too is this, position-based dynamics. So it will be done today. And then on Wednesday, we will do a Ying Wen Lu. She will do a recitation on, on this. So, so to like wrap up the self body stuff, explain you what the homework is about, what, what the next second homework is about, what do you need to do there. So that, that's the second block, self body dynamics. And the third block will be fluid, but we'll worry about that later. And then the last one is your, your final project. That's, so that's just sort of where we are. So position-based dynamics is really cool. <coughs> there are two, I guess, this is, this is the seminal paper, position-based dynamics by Matthias Miller, uh, published at VRIFS 2006. Almost the same idea was independently discovered by Yostan from Autodesk. So this is used both in games as well as in movie, like Autodesk is Maya, right? So if you know the nucleus solver in Maya, that's, that's exactly what this is using. So it's not exactly position-based dynamics, but something very close to it. Oh yeah, and I will have at Eurographics 2015 in Zurich, well, you probably won't be around, but we'll have some materials online too. I'm organizing a tutorial on position-based dynamics together with Matthias Miller, that's the guy who originally invented it, and Jan Bender, it's another professor from Germany. So yeah, we, we still need to put it together, but when we do, that should be a nice resource on all this. So why, why, why this is so interesting? So let me sort of tell you where we are. What we discussed last week was there are two ways how we can simulate mass spring systems, but then it generalizes to arbitrary deformable objects pretty, pretty, pretty easily. So let's just talk about that. You have two methods essentially, right? You can choose between explicit and implicit time integration. The explicit one essentially the lecture on Monday and the implicit on, on Wednesday, right? And we don't like the explicit methods because they are very explodey, as you will see very soon, as soon as you are as soon as you're gonna play with the homework number two. So especially in like real-time graphics when you have large forces, we discussed that you, you want to use implicit methods, right? But the problem of implicit methods is that they are complicated, right? If you are doing backward Euler, about what all you need to do. You need to compute the second derivatives, right? As if the first derivatives were not already uh, complicated enough. For springs, it's not so bad, but then if you need to do some uh, more complicated constraints, be able to find elements, or you want to do bending constraints, or some different types of potential, the non-trivial, non non-linear potentials, then you have to be differentiate everything. That's, that's doable, it's just a nu nuisance. The other problem is that then you need to have sparse linear system solvers which is a sort of complicated piece of code which you typically don't want to code up by yourself. So that's a little bit of a problem. Another problem is that these matrices, as we, as we discussed the last time, they are symmetric, but they don't have two positive death in it. So that, that stress, stress, stresses the solver even more. You have, to, you have to put there some safeguards if you want to be uh, really reliably convergent, like regularization and line search, we, we, we discussed that. So altogether, it's doable. But it's not easy. <laughs> and PBD essentially, position-based dynamics or PBD, is essentially a way to get around these problems. It's something that's almost as simple as explicit Euler and almost as stable as implicit one. So that's really a uh, nice practical technique. You know what, let me, instead of me talking, let me motivate that by the video. If it works here, I think it does. So this is the original video for the paper. So it's, it also supports rigid bodies, but I guess the main strength is in self-body physics. Should we maybe, I will lower the curtain. It's actually fun, isn't it? You like it? I mean, there's no shadow on it, so it's... <laughs> <laughs> Can you turn, turn this back? Hmm? Turn this back on. Shall I? Like this? Everybody cool with that? Yeah. 
I'm not gonna fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so there are lots of cool effects you can do with position-based dynamics, and the point is that it's really sim fair, fairly simple to do. So this, those are pressure <laughs> pressure constraints. <laughs> keep, keep an eye, uh, keep an eye on pressure constraints and how these animals were done. Sort of like imagine like inflatable rubber balloon or something. This is a, I mean, this is a fun like a gimmick thing. <laughs> But the serious thing behind this is to show the stability of this. Try to do this with your explicit Euler, or probably even your implicit Euler will fail on, on a stress, stress test like this. So here is some, some, some oh, notice this is all real time. And this is real time 2006, yeah. right? So n now, now we could do even better. <laughs> so these are collisions with south to south bodies. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are more recent demos. They, they look even better. There is, there, there, there has been, of course, work on top of that. But I will, I will start with the basics. Their, their latest silver is the unified particle physics. They later they did position-based fluids as well. And the latest thing at last SIGGRAPH, they sort of put it all together. But this, this, the main idea is right here. The main idea we'll discuss today. Yeah, so you can get like pretty cool physical effects with pretty little programming. <laughs> that's, that's the point. But yeah, you can also do a tearing. That's, that's relatively simple. Basically, if, if, this, if some of the springs, or they call it distance constraints here, if they are stretched too much, we just release them, right? That, that gives you very nice tearing <laughs> behavior. The stretching and bending, bending is like for um, the bending constraints sort of to uh, simulate how like thin shells that some material bends easier than other. I'll explain that better later. The nice thing is coupling it like you, you can already here you can couple rigid bodies and soft bodies you can see here. And the nice thing about it being real time you can just change the parameters on the fly that's exactly what's happening here. <laughs> So wind force. Ah, we haven't discussed this, but we could probably figure out how to do a wind force. That's another type of external <laughs> force. <laughs> like we have gravity, that's an easy one, but wind force will be something proportional to the area of some element. Okay, so let's take a look at how that works. So I guess the summary of what I was saying is also here. So the classical approach, that's what we discussed last week, starts from Newton's second law, the accu accusations of motion. This paper uh, presents oh, sure. a context and synthesis <laughs> framework guided by a recorded audio. Mm -hmm. For example, a real-world impact sound is given. Mm. Our algorithm estimates uh, the I think YouTube, sorry. YouTube switched to another video. Apply them to a virtual object. I did not want to do that. Okay, so we had a physics-based model employing some forces and we figure out a way to integrate the equations of motion. That's essentially what we discussed last week, right? Here is um, what, I, what I was already saying, just written down. So the main idea of PBD is here. Instead of, we won't, um, okay, PBD is not really rigorously derived from Newton's laws of motion. It sort of departs from that. It's sort of like that, like an ad hoc way to simulate dynamics. I guess that's the right way to characterize it. Which, in a sense, it's actually okay, right? Because there are different formulations of mechanics and so on, so, so it gets philosophical. In, in graphics, all that really matters are the final results, which, which you've already seen are good, right? So the key idea, in, we, we don't have the standard um, concept. We have some of the standard physics concepts, but not all of them. So instead of forces, we'll be using constraints. It's, it's a similar type of idea as uh, energy, elastic ener energy potentials, but not exactly the same. 
And the key thing that instead of in time integration, that, that was the big deal in standard physics simulation, here we'll be doing constraint projection. That's sort of the, the main thing, the main loop, the main uh, component of position-based dynamics. So let's go through it. So the, the, the spatial discretization is, is the same, essentially. The, what, what you have already seen, we have some object. We discretize it using mass points. Each of the points has some mass, some position, and some velocity. And then we connect the mass points somehow using uh, th uh, the, the, sim the simplest, most standard constant is called distance constraint. And it's really analogous to a spring, which we, which we have discussed before quite a bit when we are talking about mass spring systems. I guess I'll, I'll try to stick to the distance constraint because not, not exactly the same as a spring. The, the potential, it doesn't really have spring potential. The distance constraint is a very related concept, but not identical. Okay, so let's take a look at constraints. We will talk about constraints in, gen in, gen in general, because the distance constraint is just one example of constraint. Okay, there are other examples of constraints as you, as you saw in the video. There are bending constraints. There's the pressure constraints to simulate pressure in a character. That's what you saw these these, these funny funny guys that were being tortured. What was giving them uh, the structure was the pressure constraint inside. So what is a constraint in PBD in general? That's the main building block of PBD. It's essentially the PBD substitute for internal forces, okay? So constraint, we have a bunch of constraints. So let's say we have M constraints, and this, this indexes the constraints. So the cardinality of the constraint is how many particles it applies to. Distance constraint would apply to just two particles. It's really similar, similar to a spring. It really just says that two particles should be certain distance apart. But you can have constraints as arbitrary cardinality, right? If you want to do bending constraints, that, that would typically operate on two triangles and so on. You can also create 3D structures. That's what the Nucleus paper was taking advantage of quite uh, significantly, that you can actually create any simplicial complexes. Do you know what is a simplicial complex? That's, that's okay, let me just explain it ideologically. It's essentially a mesh which has 1D, 2D, and 3D components to it. 3D would be tetrahedrons, but you can also imagine you can do a tetrahedron because it'll stick a triangle. And from a triangle, there can be sticking out just, just edges. So a simplicity complex is the formalism to, to describe that. But we don't have to worry about that. Uh, we can, we only need to, the solver only needs to know about the constraints, essentially. So now there is a constraint function, which is something like uh, elastic potential, but not exactly the same. The one difference is that the function doesn't have to be non-negative. The elastic potential had to be non-negative, the constraint function not. We will, we will, I will go through the example of uh, the distance constraint in a bit, which will make it clear. The set of indices is just the particles which are affected by the constraint. So each constraint applies to certain particles, right? Just like with the mass spring system, you, you, probably, you, you set up some structure. And the set of indices, that's, that's what will describe the structure. Ah, this is interesting. We also have a, for every constraint, we'll have a stiffness parameter. Again, looks like in Hooke's law, the stiffness of a spring. But again, this stiffness parameter has a little bit different meaning. For one, it only goes between zero and one, right? The stiffness in Hooke's law, it was arbitrary non-negative scalar. So that's one difference. And the other difference is that it's not really compatible to it. If you have a mass spring system and you tune there some, some stiffness parameter, then you, it's, it's not, not the same as this stiffness parameter. It has so, the same sort of idea that like low stiffness will mean that the spring is, is or the distance constraint is more compliant but it's, it's not the same as Hooke's law, so keep that in mind. And the other thing is that we can have constraints of two types, equality constraints and inequality constraints. So equality constraints means that this function C wants to be zero, okay? That's, so that's what we will use for most constraints, like the distance constraint. The inequality constraints, sometimes this is called bilateral and this unilateral, the inequality, bilateral because that this basically can be written as this and this inequality, right, trivially. And the unilateral constraint that, that says that the, the, C, the, the CJ function needs to be greater or equal than zero, which is not for granted, right? It's not a potential. We don't, we don't require that to be non-negative. 
the inequality constraints that's what is used typically in collisions in collision processing the stiffness parameter can also be explained as sort of the just how strictly the constraint is enforced if the st stiffness parameter is one it means that the constraint is enforced as strictly as we can if it's zero it, it means that basically ignored and be anywhere between between zero and one we need to interpolate so that's the idea of constraints. So the particles and constraints, that's, that's the building block of PBD. That's what was used to create all, all the demos you have, you have seen in the video before. The cool thing about PBD is that the main loop is very simple. I can just write it in pseudocode like this, and there is nothing particularly tricky, maybe except for the collision detection, but that's, that's a chapter for itself. So let's go through the PBD main loop. Let me explain you what that does. So the first three steps, that's not super interesting. That's some initialization in standard physics that would be sort of providing initial conditions, right? So this is the initial position, initial velocity. And this is, we are just storing the inverse mass. Do you know why it's a good idea to be storing inverse mass instead of mass? It's just, just a detail, but in, in, in simulators, you will often see that. So it's, you can spend a minute thinking about why that's a good idea. Yep. Um, just Correct, correct. But you, yeah, that's basically the reason. It, you more often you will need the inverse mass than the non-inverse mass. So you can as well store the non-inverse mass. There's one funny trick. I'm not sure if Robin mentioned that. It's also used in rigid bodies. If you want to create a body that cannot move, if you want, or if you want to create a particle that cannot move. For example, because it's attached, right? If you are simulating cloth, like some skirt or something like that, you probably want to attach some of the vertices on the character so that they cannot move by physics, they can only move by some animation, by some other process. And the way you can do it, the, the um, a, a common trick in physics is to say that the mass is infinity. Because if the mass is infinity, that means no matter what forces are acting on, it's not going to move anywhere. <laughs> But infinity would be sort of weird number to compute with. But if you have Ws, then one over infinity, you can just say that's zero, right? And that it will just fall out in all, all the computations that follow. So that's, that's just a li neat little trick. OK, so let's take so the main. So, so this is the simulation loop. And let's go uh, through all of the steps. So in the first step, maybe you can tell me what the first step is doing, right? It's updating the velocities. The delta t would be the time step you are using. So it still has a time step. You are still computing. You have computed some frame, um, some frame, and now we are computing frame at time t plus delta t. So the w's are the inverse masses, right? And fx, they are external forces. So can you tell me what this first step means? Exactly, exactly. It's essentially explicit Euler on the velocity, right? It's just one step of explicit Euler to update the velocities. Nothing particular or special. This typically external force is usually just the gravity. You can do a wind force like this. It's usually not that big of a deal. This is very simple. Then velocities, that's, that's you, I guess you can see this as some, some sort of filter on velocities, the steps five and six. The damp velocities, that sort of acts the, this, this sort of increases the velocities, and this um, sort of simulates the damping forces. So this, um, oh, Matthias proposed some interesting damping method in the PBD paper, but you can just get away with a very simple damping method, which works fine in most cases. You can, the simplest damping method, I think I mentioned it before, right? So you say that the new velocities are some coefficient, something like this, 0 0.99 times the old. Okay, just basically scale down the velocities by a little bit. That's 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 very very simple thing, but often it does exactly what you need it. <laughs> if you overdo it, then of course it will be killing the motion too much. It will it will forbid your things from moving. This so these things are simple. And the main PBD magic i guess starts here so these pi's so again how can we interpret this the pi is xi plus delta tvi so xi are the positions of the particles and the delta tvi that's of that's of course the step that's explicit euler step over time delta t right that's the time you need to simulate from the previous frame 
sort of weird that I don't see you so clearly in the dark, but I, I trust you. <laughs> so the PIs, that's an interesting thing. The PIs are the positions where the particles would go if there were no internal forces acting on them. Okay, we only took into account so far the external forces and the, the damping forces, right? That's, that's how you can interpret this damp velocity step. So this PI, uh, the other way you can look at it, it's a proposal, proposed positions of the particles before we take into account the internal forces the, or internal elasticity of the object we are simulating because we don't strictly have any forces here. We have, we have constraints, right? So the step eight, I guess we can skip that for now. That's where, that's, that's where you will stick in collision detection, but we can first discuss it uh, without collision detection. Collision detection is a topic for itself. I guess I can just say quickly, the uh, step number eight would essentially detect collisions and would create extra collision constraints. So they are taken into account later. So the collision constraints are a little bit special because they are created on the fly, exactly by the, by the, by the step eight, okay? And the main thing of PBD, finally we got there, the main algorithm are the steps 9 to 11, which is just a loop, which for a specified number of iterations, that's typically not much. It can be like 5 or 10, typically not a, not, not a lot. I guess you typically set it to whatever number of iterations you have time to compute with if you are in real-time applications or as a parameter you expose. And what does it iterate? It iterates, uh, it projects all of the constraints, okay? So we have a list of constraints in our system. So imagine, for example, piece of cloth with a bunch of distance constraints. And what this project constraints does, it goes over all the constraints one by one and projects them, satisfies them. So I will talk about the, con the constraint projection. That's, that's the main um, idea of PBD. That's, that's essentially why it works. And I will talk about that in, in more detail. Let's see, just... But um, I guess you can look at it at a higher level. You can look at it as nonlinear Gauss-Seidel method. If you remember Gauss-Seidel for solving uh, linear systems, how does Gauss-Seidel for solving linear systems work? Gauss-Seidel works, you fix all the degrees of freedom but one, all, all the unknowns you fix to some initial value but one, and from one equation you solve for the one unknown. Then you take another unknown and repeat the process. So you essentially solve the equations one by one in Gauss-Seidel. And this is exactly the same idea for a system of nonlinear constraints. You essentially solve them one by one. It's a little bit of a miracle that it works so well, but it does. <laughs> So you do this, is, it, is that clear? You, you do several sweeps of projecting all of the constraints. So if you, have, if you have some cloth model, you go over all the, maybe if you have some cloth model like this, you have some particles here, bunch of constraints. So all these lines, they would be some constraints. This is already a model that would be doing something interesting. And you just go through them one by one every time you project a constraint and you do several sweeps through the entire system. So that's, that's this loop. Is that, yeah? I kind of didn't understand what the intuitive meaning of projecting a constraint means. Okay, I can give you a very quick intuition. We will go through that in more detail with, with all the math, but the idea, if you have a distance constraint, if you have two particles connected by a a spring, I, I want to say, but let's call it distance constraint. And the rest length of this is this. Then the projection essentially means that you just move all the particles to to the rest length. Of it. That's I guess that, that that's a good question because I should have said that. <laughs> okay. So what happens here? The so one way you can look at this. This was some this was some proposal for the piece. Here the piece are updated in such a way that the constraints are happy that they are more satisfied than they were before, okay? If you are paying attention, you can see some, some similarities to implicit Euler, but we, we can leave that discussion for later. And what happens here, so we have these, these propo the updated proposals of the particle positions, the P, and now what we need to do, we will, now we will essentially commit them. Now we will say that the P's will become 
the next uh, frame particle positions okay that they will they, they will be it they will be the result and if we do that we need to update also the velocities because xi was the previous position of the particle, pi is the new position of the particle, so we need to make the velocities agree with that. If you don't, don't do that, you will, you will see some funny, funny things. And the last step, uh, I think that's not always needed. I think you stick in things like friction or something there. We can, we can skip that for now. So I guess the, the main part of the solver, or PPD simulator are, are the ones that are not great here. So the remaining ones you can ignore for now. And uh, we will now discuss about the constraints. How do we project them? And how do we create some general constraints? Any question? Would the project constraints method be the one where the proposed positions are completed? Uh, so come again? So in the project Correct, correct, yeah. So it has it has like an, I guess you can think of it like the C notation that you pass a reference to this. So yeah, th these guys get, get updated. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and this, these, all these constraints, you can, the project constraints are essentially doing a loop through them and it's updating the particles affected by each constraint one by one. So let me discuss the constraints, I think then it will be clearer. So the, the easiest, but al also the most useful constraints is the distance constraint. So the distance constraint, but it's a function, right? A function, in this case, it takes two particles, pi and pj, and just measures the current distance minus some rest distance d, okay? So you can see it's, it's similar to Hooke's law, right? But it's not exactly the same. What is the difference to Hooke's law? Hmm? Uh, the, uh, there is the stiffness, yes. The, so you are right, the stiffness is not here. The stiffness in PPD actually appears elsewhere. But there is another another difference. It's not such a big deal, but it's something you should be aware of. Hmm? So yes, exactly. So the Hooke's law was, okay, I'll, I'll write the proper Hooke's law. <laughs> so the Hooke's law was like this, right? It's squared to create an actual energy potential, right? So here the constraint can easily be negative, and that's totally cool with PPD, okay? I mean, this, this, this thing is strange energy, and this, and this, this is constraint. Uh, oh, does it have any physical interpretation yet? Correct, correct. And it will actually never have physical interpretation. PPD doesn't really claim to simulate physics. It actually doesn't. <laughs> it just happens to look really good. <laughs> There is, there is actually, I, I will, maybe I will later explain you that there is some connection between implicit Euler and PPD, but that's, I think, still essentially a topic of ongoing research. <laughs> yep. I'm kind of wondering, if, uh, we are kind of comparing uh, that to energy, but instead of that, if we compare it to the Hooke's force, that would be of the form. Very good point, very good point. Soon enough, when we, when we will be doing the projection, we will get to something, something similar. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's not super different, right? But, oh, um, yeah. So what, um, I guess the other, the other way you, can you could look at it that what the, the constraint, what the constraint wants, the constraint is happy if this is zero, right? Or close to zero, right? And I guess this is also happy when this is close to zero. So that's not that much different. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Okay, so let's take a look at the constraint projection. So the constraint projection basically says that we want to update, we want to update these positions, the pi, pj, so that the constraint is better satisfied. When we are simulating, this will typically not be true, right? This, this, this will be something. And we want to move the positions in a state so the constraints are better satisfied. It's a little bit funny because we don't actually want them to be completely satisfied, but let's not, let's not worry about that yet. Let's make them a little bit satisfied. So if you write it down, if you wrote down all the constraints, we have, we have again, imagine, imagine some sort of mass spring system type of thing. A bunch of nonlinear constraints, right? It's clear that this is also nonlinear, right? There is the square root of the norm. 
So we have a system of nonlinear equations. So it looks like we didn't really help ourselves much, right? That's, that's what we got in Newton's method. That's, that was the key to stability in, in Newton's method, to avoid an explosion system of nonlinear equations. <coughs> And if you just were like a well-trained engineer, it would immediately light up the center of your brain saying, aha, Newton's method, right? And you could indeed do that. You could do Newton's method, except that it doesn't really work so well. It doesn't work as well as PPD, essentially. <laughs> and I guess the intuitive reason is that Newton's method is looking at the entire system as a whole, okay? and linearizes all of the constraints at, at the same time. What PPD does instead, it goes through the constraints one at a time, one by one, sort of like a nonlinear non version of, of Gauss-Seidel, okay? And that's, uh, that, that turns out that that converges really well, and it's also much easier to implement. <laughs> so that's really, it's, it's really cool. Ah, I guess this is on the next slide. So PPD goes to the constraint one by one, and for each of the constraint, when it touches the constraint, it does it does essentially a Newton step, but only on the one constraint. Okay. So what does it mean if, if I have some some system, and I have maybe I could have prepared some images maybe next time. So if I'm looking at this constraint, then I'm just looking at this. I'm ignoring all the other particles, and I just make this constraint happier. I just project it to make the, this constraint more satisfied, okay? And I do that essentially by taking one step of Newton's method, but restrict it only to the particles the constraint is touching. And the intuition why this works better than, than global Newton's method is that once you do this projection, you immediately commit it. You immediately update the proposed particle positions P. So this would be like P1, P2, P3, P4. So after you do the projection here, you immediately change P1 and P2. You immediately move it there. That's the idea of gauss seidel right? There's another iterative method which doesn't do that, which sort of waits with the comets. How is it called? We had this name before. There's gauss seidel and there's this brother. <laughs> J. <laughs> Jacobi iteration. You, you must. You certainly have heard that, right? What is the difference between Gauss Seidel and Jacobi? Gauss Seidel immediately commits the updates. It solves solves the unknowns for one equation and gets it solves one degree of freedom and immediately updates the state with that degree of freedom. So when you go on to next equation, it's already using the updated state. Okay. Jacobi does not do that. Jacobi solves all, all of the uh, equations at the same time and then commits the update at one shot. Okay? So we have a situation, because you're, you're talking about the P's at this point that are being updated. Uh-huh. Uh, so, I don't know, is there sort of a like, rippling effect? Yes. You're you absolutely right. Uh, Go seidel so the advantage of gauss seidel is that it converges faster, but the disadvantage is exact there is a bias. It indeed matters a, a little bit which constraints you project first and which you project second. So that's again this sort of like hacky, hacky nature of PPD, right? We don't really claim we simulate physics here. We just do something that looks really, really good if you look at the demo, but this bias exists there. The bias is sort of progressively removed as you do more and more iterations, but indeed it is there. I could go into more details. We, we found that it doesn't even have to preserve completely angular momentum exactly because of this bias. And it's probably fine if you're starting with where the force is acting on whatever the material at that point and then going out from there. Oh, but, but what forces are you talking about? Where the forces? Well, I'm saying like if you... Like, like if you pull on something, you like right? pull on something or like hit it with something. Yes, that's an excellent point that helps, but like in general, you kind of force is acting everywhere, right? So in practice, this bias is not much of a problem. Amazingly, it's, it's sort of surprising, <laughs> but it, it is there, yes. And actually in their, in, the, in their more recent work from NVIDIA, from the same guys, Matthias and, and his colleagues, uh, 
they actually moved away from the Gauss cycle and then they do the Jacobi iteration instead. The unified particle physics does the Jacobi, which converges a little bit slower, but why they did it is because you can parallelize that much better, right? That's, that's I think, even a bigger deal than this, this bias. You usually don't really see that bias in, in, in nor normal situations, right? You can construct contrived examples where that will be a problem. We did that just for fun, but typically it's not a problem. Yeah, and the, yeah. Okay, enough, enough said on this. So let's take a look how do we project constraints. It's sort of simple, but let's just go, go through the math. I mean, it's simple, semi-simple. <laughs> so the idea of projecting a constraint is that we want to come up with a delta P. We are at P, that's our current state. And we want to come up with delta P such that the constraint, it's a nonlinear function, is closer to zero, it's better satisfied. And what do we do? We do linear, we linearize it, right? This is our good friend, the, the gradient of the constraint. This is, this is a dot product. Uh, I'm, I'm using the same notation as in the original paper. So if you'll be reading the original paper, you will see the same notation there. Um, and the del delta P, that's just one, that's just one vector, right? That's what we want to displace the P wave. So this is a dot product of the gradient and delta P. So this is a linearization of the constraint, okay? And we need to solve for uh, delta p. Well, the, there, is, there is only one scalar equation, so we can pick the direction arbitrarily. The direction we pick is uh, the direction of the gradient, of course, because that's the direction in which the constraint is changing the most, right? I guess the geometric picture you can keep in mind. If I have my state p, the gradient, and so I guess this is how you can look at it geometrically, like il il I'm illustrating things. So the, there could be, uh, you can think about uh, the set CX equals zero as the constraint manifold, okay? That's where the constraint would be totally satisfied, right? And then there will be like isolines as you are moving further away from it, the constraint is less and less happy, right? So you can see that here we are moving to like positive values and on the other side, you would be moving to negative values of the constraint, right? If you compute the gradient, if you are at some point P here, if you compute the gradient, the gradient gives you the direction of maximum ascent. So what you probably want to do, if you want to get from P here, you want to go in the minus direction of the gradient, right? So let's just say we want to go in the direction of the gradient and we, we compute the parameter lambda, that's the step in the gradient direction we want to take. Am I making sense? And the way we compute it is sort of simple. I just substitute this here, right? So I will get CP plus, so here I have gradient CP dot gradient CP. So here I, uh, n times lambda. So here I have lambda and the norm of gradient CP squared. And that equals zero, okay? Can you see that? I think I should really shut that yeah, now it's line, right? Told you so. <laughs> <laughs> you were right. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, it really one. improves things though. <laughs> I always feel amazed when I actually walk out from the even like at Cigarette when I when I'm at Cigarette I see like this the cutting edge graphics, like all the most beautiful results. And then I come outside and go like run to a forest. It's like, wow, this is so much better. <laughs> so that means we still have a long ways to go. <laughs> all right, so we have this. Is it clear to everybody? How we got that? So from this, we, we get the, the lambda, right? Which will be minus CP. So this is a scalar. The constraint is a scalar function. It consumes a vector, but produces a scalar. And this is of course also a scalar because it's a square norm of that. And that's the step I need to take. It gives me the minus, not surprisingly, because the gradient, of course, points in the direction of maximum ascent, so I have to go with minus. And this is the lambda, which I plug right here, and I get the delta P. So I take this, I multiply it by the gradient, that's, that's the direction I wanna be going. And this is my update, okay? Very simple. It's essentially one step of Newton's method just on one constraint.
Okay, there is one uh, very important consideration. We are playing all these tricks with physics, but we actually have to be very careful. If you do it in random ways, you can destroy things. So one very important property is to preserve, at least locally, linear and angular momentum. Okay, so what does that mean? Is that we have to make, uh, take care, let's, we show it like this. If we are projecting the distance constraint, there it's sort of obvious. Let's say we have some stretched distance constraint. If the projection set, the projection cannot be arbitrary. Let me put it this way. If the projection set that the delta of this P1 will be like this, this will be delta P1, and the delta P2 will be something like this. Now this would be totally weird, right? What the, what the constraints need to do, they sort of need to imitate internal forces, right? And if the internal or the imitation, if the approximation of the internal forces was allowed to, to translate the center of mass of the particles associated with the constraint, that looks really weird. That's some people use that to call it ghost forces because it means that th there is essentially some artificial force which is pulling your object in, in weird ways. It, it looks really weird if, if you get this wrong. It's actually sort of easy to get this wrong. We need to think carefully to get this right. And by get right, I mean preserve uh, the linear and angular momentum of all particles when we are projecting a constraint. Okay, there is one thing, one like extra credit type of thing you can think about. The preservation of angular momentum in PBD is actually not satisfied, but that's just that's just below below the line. That's that's it's usually not not much of a problem in practice. So let's take a look at the important thing. The important thing is how do we make sure that the center of mass is conserved? So here I will I write the deltas in terms of the individual particles. So the delta pi is the displacement of one particle. So that means I take the gradient just with respect to a single particle. And just like before, uh, I will have some scaling factor here. So this is really just the same formula as I had before just written in terms of individual particles. And you will see in a second why I'm, I'm doing that, okay? So this, this sum, I, I hope that everybody agrees that this, this sum here, this, this, this part here, is equal to the norm of the gradient with respect to all of them. That's, that's basically what we had here or here. So this is the same thing, right? This is just gradient per, per component. And why uh, I'm doing this? I'm doing this so we can uh, express the conservation of linear momentum. That's, that's one important consideration because without it, it, it will look weird. So here is a cool property or like a, like a lemma or something. If we have translation invariant constraint, then the sum of the gradients of the constraint is zero. So in other words, if the constraint satisfies this, if I translate both of the particles pi and pj by the same vector t, if I, if I translate the distant constraint somewhere else, both translate by the same amount, then it, the value doesn't change. That's certainly true for the distance constraint, right? And this basically says that we would like to design all our constraints this way so that we can um, achieve conservation of linear momentum. So this implies that the sum of gradients is exactly zero. If you want a little math exercise, you can, you can think about the reasons why. It's just a little calculus uh, exercise. And this is basically all we need. So, so this is all we need. So that's why this is all we need. If all the particles have identical masses, Okay, why is that? Because uh, the conservation, if, if all the particles have the same masses, then, then, then it doesn't matter what, what, the total, what, the, what the actual mass is, right? What matters is the differences between the masses. And the, the uh, momentum will be conserved if the sum of all the displacements will be zero, right? But the sum of all the displacements, the sum of delta pi's, if, uh, the sum is just some uh, scalar multiple sum alpha times the gradient respect to pi cp 
So the alpha can certainly go here, right? So if the if the sum of the gradients, okay, let's just do it slowly. If the sum of the gradients is zero, then this certainly is also zero, right? And this is this is the center of mass if the the masses are identical for all the particles, okay? Right. Yes, that's exactly it. So if the particles don't have the same masses, and that's that's what sometimes is useful. I guess the extreme case would be if some particle had infinite masses, right? So it would have the this was supposed to be m high, like this. So in general, if the particles don't have equal masses, then the, the center of mass you compute, of course, as a, as a weighted linear combination weighted by the masses, right? So if you want to preserve the center of mass, then the displacements of the particles, when scaled by the masses, must sum to zero, okay? So we need to change the update a little bit. What we need to do is that the delta pi will now be um, scaled by the inverse mass, w. Okay, and wh why, why do we do that? Well, that's sort of obvious that we, we do that so that if we now take this delta pi and we compute this, then as you can probably already see, then this, this wr and mi will cancel. So we are again back to this sum of the gradients, cp, which from the, from the assumption of translation invariance of the constraint, this, this will again be zero, right? So this, this wi, is uh, the trick to make uh, the constraints preserve center of mass or preserve linear momentum if the masses are not all equal. Make sense? Yeah, and then we can sim similarly derive the S. Let's 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 take a look. To just make it, I hope, not more confusing, but more clear. So, uh, if I write the update like this, so this is if this is this is just the linearization written per particle. So this is CP, and I write the dot product as transpose and delta PI. That's my that's my usual notation. Can you see that one? So we want to make this zero. So this is this is just again linear, linearization of the constraint. But now for the delta pi, we will plug in this formula scaled by the wi. Okay. So if I do that, what what we will get? We will get. So we will get the gradient squared, right? And we will get here minus s wi the gradient with respect to pi squared. Okay, and we want this to be zero. Well, from this we can compute the scaling factor, right? And again, sim similar to before, we will see that this is CP divided by this sum, but now it's weighted, right? That, that's the only difference. That's essentially why I'm deriving that. PI CP squared, okay? And that's exactly what you have here. That's, that's where it came from. So that's really just a refinement of what we had here. Here it's sort of, if, if all of these weights are the same, you can as well take it away. But if they are, so that's, that's what we had here. But if the masses are different, I guess that's another, another reason why we want to score the Ws instead of the masses. Okay. So I guess this is basically all the math there is in PPD. Maybe it will be clear, you have a question? This one? Yeah. So this is the same as we had here. So this is this is basically just a different way of writing that the delta pi goes in the direction of the gradient of the constraint, right? The geometric picture to keep in mind is this, right? We have the constraint function which goes up and down, and the gradient is the direction of maximum increase, 
okay yeah I admit this is a little bit confusing and that's because I just like, took the notation from the paper this lambda is what is minus s here so this is just a change of notation sorry but that's that's what the paper did maybe I should really change it and not try not try to be compatible and then the only thing we do so this is this is um, this is the same the only difference is that we stick in the W here okay so this is still the direction of the grade so this is a gradient with respect to a single constraint weighted by the inverse mass and the weighting is there so that we preserve the center of mass and conserve linear momentum consequently Does that make sense maybe <laughs> Maybe this needs a little bit to, to, to soak in. I guess what, what usually helps is you if, if, if you derive it by yourself <laughs> on the paper. That, that's where you usually get it. <laughs> if, if you have some doubts about that, maybe you don't. Oh, you know what? Let, let me do, let me do uh, an example of a distance constraint. That's a very illustrative example. So, uh, so far, uh, I was deriving everything for a general constraint. The constraint could have been anything. The constraint was just a function operating on a bunch of particles. So let's take a look at some specific constraints. And the, the simplest and also very useful one is the distance constraint, right? I guess the bad news is you, you will not get away from computing the derivatives. You still need to compute the derivatives of the constraint. So here is the derivative with respect to P1, derivative with respect to P2. The good news is that uh, unlike implicit uh, Euler, you don't have to be computing the second derivatives here. Just the first derivatives will, will cut it. So yeah, if, if, if you do that, uh, I guess you could, that would be another very simple exercise on uh, multivariate calculus. You, you will get that the derivative is the normal, uh, sorry, normal, nor normalized vector P1 minus P2. So that's what this is. And if you differentiate with respect to P2, it's the same thing with a bit of minus sign. Again, if you want a, a little bit of exercise and multivariate calculus, you can try to derive it by yourselves. And the scaling, so let's, uh, let's try to derive the S here. So what is the S? So I said the S is this S. So as this the value of the constraint, right? So hmm, how do I put that? Ah, I know how to do this. I'll do it like this. Actually, I wish always there was some software. There probably is some software, right? That I can put this on a tablet, maybe, maybe next time, next year. <laughs> I'll get a tablet and do a software that can do this manipulation right? to be bending paper. So the constraint is this, P1 minus P2 minus D. So that's what we have here. What is the squared norm of the gradient of each of them? How much is that? Something very simple. If I square, if I take the square norm of N, how much do I get? One. Exactly, one. <laughs> so this essentially goes away. So in the denomin denominator, I have just W1 plus W2. So that's all there is. So this is really, the, so this is the S in general, and this is the S for the distance constraint. Okay, that's what we got here. And if we do the delta P1, well, let's see what the delta, so this is, oh, here is, here is the general formula. So the general formula says, take the S with the minus sign and multiply it by W, in, in this case, W1. If I multiply it by W1 and take a minus sign, I get exactly this after I multiply it with the gradient. So the gradient here, it's the normal, so that's this. Do you see that? So this is, um, so this is, this is a specific instance of this general formula for the distance constraint, okay? And for P2, the only difference is that here you put the minus uh, N vector, so you will get Oh, and the other, other thing is that you put their W2 because it's the second particle. Okay, so these, the delta P1 and delta P2, those are the final formulas you need to implement in your PBD solver. And that's essentially it. That's, that's the hardest part there. Question? Could you explain that part about how you got, to, got S again? The square, the one you mentioned. This, this S? Yeah. I just substituted uh, the actual values of this, this, the specific, the distance constraint, I plugged it in here. Mm 
Okay, so the distance comes in this case the the p the n is two. Okay, <laughs> this is a general constraint which can have m whatever whatever number of particles you want. In this case, it's simple. There are just two, right? So the numerator th that's the norm of p one minus p two minus d. So that's that's what we have here. The square norms are one because the norm of n and norm of minus n square norm is, is one. So here I have just w1 plus w2. Got it? Cool. And the, so this is this is what we get. This is what you code up in the this is what the constraint projection step will be doing. It will update p1 by delta p1 and p2 by delta p2. In the distance constraint, it's actually super nice because it it it, hap it it's it so happens that the distance constraint satisfies your um, or the distance constraint projection satisfies your constraint exactly. It's the, it's, it's it's quite cool. If, if you think about it, it makes sense, right? What is the p1 minus p2 divided by the norm? That's a unit length vector in this direction, right? And the uh, the minus n, of course, is the vector in the opposite direction, right? And this is the current length of the distance constraint, right? The d was the, the rest length, and this is the current length. So what this says, so that this is the current length min minus the length I want it to be. And this is essentially just a weighted uh, splitting of, of, this, of this value, right? So I'm just making it, I'm maybe making it more complicated than it, than it is. This, this just this just says that if I have the particles like here, you know what? Hey, let's 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 say let's say that both the masses are the same. The w1 equals w2. Okay, doesn't matter if it's like hundred tons or one milligram because all that matters because the units will 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 kill kill themselves or cancel out, right? So if both of them are are equal, what 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 is this value here and what is this value here? One half, right? So in that case, this amount of displacement is split equally between the two particles, right? And it's it's easy to see that after you do the displacement, after you do the after you do p1 plus delta p1, so this this guy would be p1 plus delta p1. This guy here would be p2 plus delta p2. After you do that, you will end up with the dis distance exactly d. Yep. So it's not going to oscillate. It's just going to, to get satisfied one constraint. That's a great point. Uh, the one constraint has nowhere to oscillate. That's that's already done, right? But but we are sort of neglecting that there will probably be some other constraints attached to to these particles, right? And most more likely than not, once you project this one, the others will actually get violated more, right? And that's why we are iterating over all of the constraints. That's why we are doing multiple sweeps through all of the constraints, right? So you touch this, then you project, you project this, project this, project this, project everything else, project this, project this, project this, and then you do another sweep. Then you project this again. So say they sort of like all, all, all fight together, but it works, it, it converges amazingly well, as, as you have seen. <laughs> The cool thing about projecting the distance constraint is that it satisfy it gets the constraint really to zero. It gets you to p1, p2 equals zero. That doesn't have to be the case in general, because it, we, we just did a linearization, we just did one step of Newton's meta. It's not guaranteed to shoot exactly to zero, but in the case of the distance constraint, it actually does. Okay. There are some in, in other types of constraints, this won't be the case. So let's take a look at other types of constraints. Oh, let me know as you ask about the oscillation. The oscillation uh, can happen if you are, if, uh, I have seen it happen when we are trying to be smart about the order of the constraints. So uh, if, if you don't keep the order of the constraints as you are projecting them fixed, but you are trying to do like something different. For example, you might think first projecting the constraints that are violated the most or some, something like that. Then it can actually start oscillating in a weird way. <laughs> but how do, how do model uh, structures of different elasticity? Structures of different elasticity? What uh -huh. do you mean? Like, I mean, how do models bridge different, different constants? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah, I think I forgot to put it here. 
the, the stiffness the stiffness in PBD is sort of a hack <laughs> the stiffness in PBD means that the K multiplies this displacement so if the K is 1 that's I guess that's the case I had here then you are doing the full displacement and if the K is smaller then the constraint does not really get projected completely it's a complete hack it's not very nice <laughs> It sort of does what you want, right? That it's, it says that the constraint will not be like so strict. But the I guess the the weird um, well, let's let leave the discussion for later. <laughs> what I wanted to go through now is other types of constraints. One constraint that's very useful if you are doing things like cloth is bending constraint. The most uh, simple thing you can do for a bending constraint, so if I have two triangles, let's imagine this is like a small piece of cloth or something. If I have two triangles and this, 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 I can imagine this is like a hinge joint, right? So this is something that can be bending out of plane. And I don't want it to be bending too much. I want the cloth to be nice and smooth, so I want to penalize the bending. So I want to create a bending constraint which will penalize two large bends along this, this hinge. I guess here I, here I have a little bit better 3, 3D picture. So this is, this is like a hinge axis or something. And the constraint says that I don't want to be bending too much. So the easiest way you can do that is you can just create another distance constraint between these two particles. Let's call them P1 p3 and p4 I can just put there a distance constraint right which will sort of do what I want right because imagine if, if, if you are bending this out of out of plane that this constraint will start becoming unhappy right the problem that's that's what's written here this actually affects the in-plane stretching so if you want to control <coughs> the parameters independently, if you want to control the bending independently of the in-plane stretching, this will actually not do it, right? Because if you put this, this it will also resist if I pull on the P4 like this, right? And that, that might not be what I wanted, or essentially it will, it will change your stiffness. So I guess the point is this makes parameter tuning a little bit more difficult. But with PBD, no problem. With PBD, you can define a proper bending constraint, which actually measures the real angle between the two triangles. Oh, actual bending constraint. So how do we do it? We compute the normal of the first triangle by taking cross product of the edges. You, you all know that. Normal of the second triangle. And then I compute the angle between the two normals. I don't want to spend forever on this so just so this this is this is this is the formula you get ultimately it looks complicated but it's nothing really complicated right all this does is p2 minus p1 that's this vector p3 minus p1 is this vector so the cross product will give me this i normalize it so i get a uh, unit vector here I get the same, I do the same thing on the second triangle with, with opposite, opposite direction. And the phi zero is the rest length angle. Sometimes you want to simulate not just flat things. If you are doing like cross simulation, then you probably have developable surfaces, which means that they are flat at their rest pose. But you can have other types of material, like imagine like hat or like a Coke can or something, which in the rest pose, it's already curved, right? That's what the phi zero angle is there for. That's that's the rest length, uh, rest pose angle. Okay, so here in the flat country, the way I the way it's set up here, the flat configuration corresponds to one eighty. Doesn't really matter. You could do it the other way around too. Now this gets a little bit funny to differentiate, but you can differentiate it. And if you plug it in the constraint projection mechanism weighted with the inverse masses, you get another set of update rules. I guess that's the very end of the PPD paper. That's, that's this, that's the bending constraint projection. So I mean, the math is a little bit hairy, but at the end you get some fairly simple formulas. You need to be a little bit careful about the numerics, not to divide by some zeros, but that, that's pretty much the only trick there. And by this, you get a very, very nice bending constraint. 
Now, another very fun constraint is the pressure constraint. That's what created all these cool infla inflated animals there. <laughs> and that's a funny type of constraint because notice it operates on all the particles, all the vertices of my mesh. So if you will, this, what, what this first term does, does somebody have an idea what this first term does? What this first term means? Uh, let's start with a second term, that's easier. V0 is the rest post volume, okay? And K pressure is a co pressure coefficient, which tells me how much the rest post volume inflates or deflates. If it's greater than one, it means I'm inflating it. If it's smaller than one, it means I'm deflating it, okay? And what is the first term, what do you think? Or do you, do you know this formula? Okay, let me explain this. Let me explain this in 2D. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let me tell you what it is and then I will explain it. It, 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 it computes a volume of a closed mesh. Mm. So let me explain this in 2D in case you haven't seen this. You probably should hear it at least once at college. This is a thing that's sometimes called the shoelace formula, or it's also uh, derived from the divergence theorem. So if, I, if I'm in 2D, let me explain it in 2D, that's easier. This is the same idea in 3D. So if I, have, if I give you a polygon, an oriented polygon, so a set of connected edges, and, I, and some center, or some point, some reference point, and I want to compute the area of the polygon. Well, how do I do it? Well, I cut it into small triangles. Well, not so small triangles, just triangle for every edge. And I compute the area of every triangle, right? But amazingly, the same formula also applies even if for wherever the reference point is. The reference point doesn't really matter. I'm trying to draw the same polygon. So if you put the reference point here, Everything still works if you uh, count signed areas of the triangles. Have you have you seen this before? Is it the first time? No. So the, yeah, this this is a, this is a cool little trick. So let's see. So if so again, I, I will do all the triangles, but here the triangle uh, will have a negative area. Okay, this one too. That's a second triangle. I'm sort of marching here here. Then I do the, another one. And this one will have a positive area. It's because this this is this is edge number one. This is edge number two. Number one, number two. Where does that go? One of them should be counterclockwise, and yeah, and this one is clockwise. So this has positive area. So the cool thing is, uh, this one that has positive area will add this area and subtract this area. Okay, then you go to this one, it will add this area and subtract, delete all the stuff that was there. And once, once you do it for all of them, you have exactly computed the area of, of the polygon, even though your point was not really inside. Sort of cool. And in 3D, it works exactly the same way. You, you compute the volumes of the tets with respect to an arbitrary point. If you don't believe my hand wavy justification, you can also derive this rigorously from the divergence theorem. This is the theorem which says that integration over the interior, you can convert to integration of the derivative on the boundary, something like that. And th this, this is exactly that. So here, here what it does, it computes the volume in the current configuration of my object, assuming the object is a, is a closed surface mesh. Like, like like these animals you, you have seen there. They are they're, they're essentially bag of triangles with, which, are, which are well behaved and closed. So you compute the volume. And this constraint says that the current volume which wants to be this, okay? So if the K pressure is one, it just wants to retain the rest post volume. And if you crank up the K, then it sort of inflates. <laughs> it's sort of funny. Position constraints are sort of dumb, but very important. Position or position constraints or attachment constraints or point constraints. They don't really conserve momentum, but what, 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 what they are. They are constraints as just a single particle. I guess if I want to write it 
there's really no need to write this formally, but if you really wanted to write it formally, and you would write it like this, would be constrained on a certain single particle and just wants the particle to go to a specified target location. So that's ex that's that's one way you could you could create like like a skirt or something. You would just create a bunch of position constraints like on the on the on the waist or something, and then you would animate the T's, those are the target positions, to whatever your keyframe animation does. If you are creating a character with a skirt, then the character is probably animated using keyframing and then the skirt needs to be attached to the character so it actually goes with it, right? You can also do it using friction, but it, that's more complicated and you are risking that it actually will fall off, which is usually not okay. So you can just stitch it there, attach it there using the attachment constraints, and then it just will be there, no, no discussion, right? The projection of these constraints is trivial. Just take the point and move it to where you want it, move it to T, right? You could also derive it, but sort of silly, it's just, it's, 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 it's trivial. And the other trick you can play on top of it, as I said, you can also set the mass to infinity. What it does, this constraint puts it to the right place, and the infinite mass will say that other constraints, which might also contain the particle P1, will no longer change it. So the position constraint is, will, are, will actually be non-negotiable. <laughs> Make sense? Cool. So here is a, let's see. A quick note about collision constraints. I guess I will go quickly about collisions because collision processing is a is a chapter for itself, and I will do some lecture later about like advanced collision processing. Simple collision processing is easy. That's what you sort of already do, right? Like detecting um, detecting a collision of a particle with a with a sphere or with a with a ground plane or with an ellipsoid. That's 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 all simple. What do you do in PBD if you detect collisions, then you create these special unilateral collision constraints. So I can show the result right here. So the situation is uh, we had a particle that started here and then it moved inside rigid object, which is a problem. We don't like that. We detected the collision. We found we find where the collision first happened as the uh, as the point traveled from x to p the first time it hit the object was here so we draw a tangent plane that's that's the tangent plane and we establish a constraint which which will say something like this something like x minus qc dot product with nc must be non-negative so that's the constraint says that the x must be on this direction on this side of the tangent plane, okay? And that's a type of unilateral constraint because I have just one inequality there. I have this a constraint where I don't want this to be equal to zero. I just want it to be greater or equal than zero. Because of course, if, if, if the point already is here, that everything is cool, I don't have to do anything, right? And that also tells you how to, how to project this constraint. So the constraint projection step for the unilateral, for the inequality constraint, works like this. It computes the constraint. If it's satisfied already, it does nothing. If it's violated, it projects it as if it was an equality constraint. Simple. It works amazingly well. Uh, it does, it, that's, that's how the collision detection in all the demos was done. Okay. So I guess this is once again the PBD main loop. So now you probably understand why do we create the collision constraints here, right? Because what, whatever collides, it, it changes every time step. Most of the constraints, like the distance constraints, they will be the same all the time, but these collision constraints, they come and go, right? As, as, as things collide. Yeah, so this is the PPD loop. So let's uh, quickly discuss the pros and cons of PBD compared to implicit Euler. I guess we can already rule out explicit Euler for being too exploding. Or, you know what, let's, um, well, okay, so what, what are the advantages of PBD? One advantage is that it's easier to implement for sure. You don't need any sparse linear system solvers. You don't have to compute the second derivatives and assemble the sparse matrices. It's just much less of a headache, right? 
and it's great for real-time applications because you can you can tune the number of constraint projection iterations this solar iterations number exactly so you actually compute it within the time budget right if you are doing a game you can only spend that much time in physics if you have a sparse linear system solved and then you cannot really negotiate the time the solver is going to take it will just take some time right but here here you can just just tweak it so what are the limitations of PBD? There is quite quite a few. So it's, it's it's important to be aware of the limitations. It's not a panacea. So first of all, it doesn't really um, converge to anything uh, useful. What do you think in in typical cases? What 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 the PBD would converge to? Or let's let me ask it this way. If PBD managed to satisfy all distance constraints on, on a typical cloth mesh, for example, exactly, where would it what 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 it, what would it do? <laughs> the point is you don't really want all the distance constraints to be satisfied exactly, right? If they are, if, if for, for some general mesh, what does that mean? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's 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 a can there can be a rigid body transformation on the rest post, but the shape cannot really change, except for some special configurations where it can like where where you can like if you have if you have a mesh and you happen to have a chain of edges where you can bend the exact thing, but that's very rare, right? That's that's almost in, in, that's probability zero type of event. So. That typically the P before general mesh for general set of constraints, this would converge to rigid transformation of the rest both. So it doesn't really converge to anything. No, not, not, not something you would want, right? If you want to do rigid bodies, then you are better off doing a rigid body solver. Um, the, the thing with PBD is that you will never really let it converge there. <laughs> because usually the problem you have is exactly the opposite problem. You don't give it enough iterations, or uh, equivalently, the solver converges very slowly. Newton compared to Gauss Seidel. Gauss Seidel is like real, really bad competitor. Gauss Seidel converges way slower than Newton. It's actually funny because initially it converges quite good. Initially it does good progress, but as it keeps going, the progress gets slower and slower. So usually what you get with PBD is over stretchy behavior. In a sense, you can interpret it that the PBD sort of trade like sacrifices good material properties for fast computations. That's one way you can look at that. The other problem with PBD is that uh, the parameter tuning. As I said, the stiffnesses, they are not really the, the Hookian stiffnesses. They're not really the real stiffnesses of the material, right? It's just sort of hacked saying that we'll project a little bit less. What is worse, if you change the number of solver iterations, then you have to go and change all their stiffnesses because they, they are related, right? If you do more iterations, then the material appears more stiff. So that's, that's a little bit annoying because you, you would hope that by cranking up the number of iterations, you would actually make it better, which you will, but you will also make the deformations to look different. <laughs> So there were some improvements of PBD. There, one of them is hierarchical PBD. I guess I don't have time, but you can you can look it up for yourselves on YouTube. For so that will be your homework, which you might actually do. Watch the hierarchical PBD video. <laughs> that will show you uh, how uh, the PBD converges slowly, and there is a trick, a multi-grid type of trick, how to avoid that. It's not very much used though because it gets complicated and it further complicates the tuning of the parameters. And they have uh, another cool trick how to improve the stretchy behavior called the long range attachments. That's a special type of constraints which basically is, which constrains two particles which are far away. Like imagine skirt like the, the hem of the skirt and, 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 and the waist and it says that the, the skirt should not really stretch beyond certain radius. <laughs> Very simple idea, but uh, helps, help, helps. Oh, sorry, I'm not showing this. Helps a lot. Long range attachments, that's what I was gonna say. Okay, so that's PBD. That's the last bit you needed for your homework too, where you will get to play with all these things, explicit, implicit, and PBD. You can actually get your hands on all these ideas. <laughs>
Okay. And is the next class the recitation? The Correct. Class? That's that will be the recitation for the homework. Yeah. So we'll be like wrapping up all all that we said. Thank <laughs> you.